Hello and welcome back to my channel. Um, it's a rainy Thursday afternoon and I've been sorting out shelves. <laughs> I've been clambering up my bookcases and pulling down armfuls of dusty books and reaching into the furthest corners um, just to find things that I haven't seen for a long time. <laughs> um, uh, because I've been, as you know, reordering some of my shelves and seeing what I can get rid of, if anything. Um, the best thing about doing this kind of sorting, and as you can see in the corner, um, things are looking, ignore the boxes, the boxes are paperwork. <laughs> the life of a writer. Um, the, the bookcases are, believe it or not, tidier. They're more organised. I've got things like my Armistead, Armistead Mopans together, my David Sedaris's are together. That is a huge move forward, I think, in organisational terms. I've also got together these four novels, uh, which is um, the, the output of a particular writer called Lou Wakefield. Uh, these are from, they're kind of romantic comedies, I guess you'd call them. Uh, Hodder published them 2006, this one. There's Hot to Trot from 2006. Um, and Sleeping Partners. Looks like it's about the same time. Uh, 2004. So these are 20 years ago. Rural Bliss. Um, 2002. And Tuscan Soup. Now these are ready for a reread, I think, 2001. Lou Wakefield was one of the writers of one of my favourite radio shows ever, uh, with, is it Carol Heyman is the other? And together they wrote Ladies of Letters, a show that was on Radio 4 about 2001 to 2006, I think. Um, it became a TV show later, a slightly misguided TV show that was well cast, but idiotic in its premise, in that the, t the, the radio show um, made you imagine the lives of these two characters, these two fantastic women who wrote letters to each other and occasionally met up and had ridiculous um, set twos and set pieces. The TV show literalised all of that, so you saw what went on. That wasn't the point. The whole point of a um, a novel in letters is that the reader gets to imagine uh, how much people are exaggerating, how much they're lying, how reliable the narrator is. Anyway, Ladies of Letters is my favourite thing. And the Christmas disc, because they came out as a series of discs as well, the Christmas series is one of the funniest things um, I ha I've ever heard, I think. Um, Ladies of Letters make mincemeat. I think there was about, about 10 series all in all. It was Prinella Scales, and Patricia Routledge originally performing them. Anyway, Lou Wakefield went off and produced these novels as well, which I um, then read at the time. And I think that's been it. I think it's been the four. They're what we would recognise now as... Um, it's the same kind of genre as some of my other favourites, people like Millie Johnson and Carol Matthews and Jill Mansell. They are... Um, Romantic comedies. Um, this one's set in Italy. It's been more than 20 years since single art teacher Marion Hardcastle visited Italy, but memories of that happiest of times still haunt her. So when Tom and Janice Cowlishaw invite her on holiday, the lure of a blissful week in a Tuscan palazzo proves too much to resist. Perhaps Tom's words, hasta la vista, the tickets have come, should have warned her. But long before she gets on the plane, Marion realises she might not have a lot in common with her holiday companions. Um, the stock in trade, I guess, the humour is all based on um, snobbery and misunderstandings, the usual stuff of sitcom, of the kind of the classic English comic novel. Um, each has a different kind of setting. This one... Rural Bliss is about somebody moving to the countryside. Uh, and then there's one. This looks like it's a proof copy. It's very heavy. Um, yeah, it's a proof from Hodder. 
in two th from the days when I used to get sent proofs of things. Amazing. Uh, they don't do that so much these days. You don't get... Maybe people do. I don't. <laughs> I used to get sent all sorts of things in the hope that I would um, either talk about them or review them for something or review them on my blog, as it was, back in 2006 to 2012. I used to keep a, a regular blog. Um, anyway, this is a, a proof copy of Hot to Trot, and this one is where she goes off to, um, again, a 30-something going nowhere, an actor, and she makes online friends, and she goes off to Canada. She falls in love with a Canadian cowboy. I have vague memories of that. And... Uh, sleeping Partners was, oh, well, they swap houses and they go to Australia. They go from Leicester to Australia. And so it's a fish out of water story. And I think you see both sides. Um, I'm not sure which one was my favourite of all of these. I don't think they're still available. I shall have to check up and to find out um, what Lou Wakefield has done since. Um, I don't know how old she was when she did these. Not very. Anyway, how lovely to have all four together and ready for some kind of reread or dipping into. That's what you end up doing when you try and sort books out. You end up finding things that you want to dip back into and go back to. Like, oh God, daft things. <laughs> Whitley Strieber's Cat Magic. I read this in 1985, I think. And it's a kind of horror novel that later he said, um, showed him the first glimmerings of his life as an alien abductee in the symbolism and the subtext to this particular novel, Whitley Strieber started to suspect that he'd been uh, regularly kidnapped by aliens throughout his life. And oddly, I remember reading this before any of that came to light, I think. Um, this is what it says on the back. In the sleepy little town of May, sorry, Maywell, New Jersey, George Walker completes his first experiment in reanimation. He kills an animal, then brings it back to life. But before he can start, try a human subject, the deadly feline force unleashed by his first success places the entire community in danger. And when his niece Amanda comes to town, she finds herself at the mercy of a mysterious sect known as the Tabernacle of the Risen Lord. Amanda is on a spiritual quest of her own a quest that may transform her beyond all human knowing or plunge her into the abyss of a horrifying death. It just sounds absurd. I've read this twice. I don't remember much about what happens to Amanda. I think she has some kind of slightly crazy adventures involving cats. My whole project, I suppose, is to combine this with this. <laughs> this is missing the sense of humour this has. Maybe this is missing the sense of peril and ludicrous adventure that this has. And my attempts to fuse these genres um, kind of mark out the parameters of my pathetic writing career. I call it pathetic, of course, because nobody wants to read Cat Magic meets Tuscan Soup, apart from me. Here's something I read a long time ago. William Boyd, who I've rediscovered this year. This was Christmas. Oh, 92. Um, and the reason I went out and bought a collection of stories by William Boyd was I heard a story called Not Yet, Jayette on the radio, on Radio 4, The Afternoon Story. Um, I think I've talked about this before on here. It's a story that, that is about being a fan, really. Um, somebody, a writer, who's waiting to see Christopher Isherwood on the beach where he knows he goes for walks. It's a bit like Georgina Hammock's story about Noel Coward, um, but it always stuck in my mind. And I, I did enjoy the whole the whole book, actually. The whole collection, and maybe I should return to this too, because I don't remember the others. But then again, it's whatever it is, 32 years later. Now, here's something that's come back into... People's Ken, um, Truman Capote's Answered Prayers, the um, feud TV show about Capote and the Swans is currently um, being talked about. It's on whatever it's on. Disney, what I don't get anymore. <laughs> um, since I stopped the majority of my streaming services, but I saw some of it and it was beautifully made. I don't know if I've said it before, but I 
love anything by and about Truman Capote, and I've got lots of books about him. My favourite of all, I think, being the George Pimlico book, the biography that Pimlico, Pimlico? George, oh, that's awful, his name is gone. Anyway, George, somebody, <laughs> begins with a P. Uh, it should be around. Anyway, he writes a biography of Capote without um, uh, a single word of his own appearing in the book. So he um, compiles the whole book from quotes about Capote in chronological order, um, divided into chapters that describe big chunks of his life. And we kind of swim through the book, as he says, uh, as if we are walking through a party from one end to the other, overhearing gossip about this incredible, bizarre person who had this amazing life, as Capote did. And the book of letters that they published, Capote's letters are astonishing. His short stories are my favourite of all of his books, I think. Um, my favourite story in itself is A Christmas Story, which I read every Christmas, the one about him as a child and his elderly, older, anyway, cousin, Souk, making 32 Christmas cakes every year and dancing drunk around the kitchen when they drink the whiskey that they've got from somebody making moonshine by the river. Um, Everything by Capote, I think I've read, I just, I love. Um, Answered Prayers is the book that he was slowly trying to write in the late 60s, 70s, into the 80s. <coughs> I never found the full manuscript, whether it existed or not. Just these chapters that went out in glitzy magazines and that caused such a fuss when they were published because he said um, he blew the, the story on lots of his kind of um, well-to-do friends that he had knocked around the world with. He'd become part of the jet set and learned all their secrets, all their gossip, and then he spilled the beans in these very glossy short stories. They're quite racy and quite um, unpleasant in some ways. I should reread these again, because even though you know they caused such damage and they ruined his life in the end, um, they're still, you know, they're still Capote and still worth reading. It's his ear for dialogue, for gossip, for tuning into people. That's what writers do, I think. Whatever else they tell you writers do, what they really do is tune into people. That's, that's the most important ability of all. And I know people who can wing it, who can fake it, and I, I, I read people who can do that, but you know the real ones who can really tune into how people think and how people talk and how those things can be blended um, to make pages that, that, that pull you on into a story. And the story might not be about much. I mean, these stories, on the surface, not a lot always happens. Um, but I think that's what that's what the really the writers I really like anyway. That's what they do. They can tune in to people, and and become them, almost become them. What else is on my pile? Uh, e. M. Forster. When I thought I'd read everything by E. M. Forster in the early nineties, it's ninety two Christmas. When I thought I'd read everything, this book um, came back into print. I think. And it's Forster's stories, but these are the life to come and other stories. They are the, the gay short stories where he gets a bit saucy. <laughs> Look, there's an after right um, envelope <laughs> from Christmas 92, holding a page, keeping a place in the book there. They're not very saucy, of course. They are suggestive, I suppose, rather than explicit. But you're in no doubt about what's going on and what's at stake. And um, they're very worth reading. I love going back to Forster. I should have his books together. I recently got that really nice 
edition of Howard's End, the folio edition. So maybe I should, it's about time I put together the copies of Forster that I really care about. Most of them are probably battered penguins, but the battered penguin, a novel. There's a Star Trek novel, David Gerald, and this is the Galactic Whirlpool from, I guess, the 70s. I can't even see the print so small. 1980. I read this. It doesn't say when. It smells like science fiction bookshops used to. A compound of smoke, must, um, spices from some alien bazaar. <laughs> and they've always got these yellowed edges. <clears throat> As if they've arrived in some kind of load on a spaceship and been dropped off in the dusty back room of a bookshop on the road out of town. That's how science fiction arrives. Not on IMAX cinemas or, or streaming services or all of that. For me, science fiction arrives on the slightly dusty shelves of a slightly dirty bookshop that's slightly intimidating to visit. <laughs> but you find something that costs about, well, pound fifty, and has a very outdated kind of painted cover like that. This one, um, right, I'll read the back. What you have to do, and I was reminded of this today, is uh, from when I was reading um, a novel, I was reading, oh, The Little Penguin Bookshop. I'm in the middle of this still. And she talks about the way to choose books, the way to see if you're going to fall in love with a book. It's like standing at, on the platform with a train about to go and you're looking at the penguins, because it's a penguin bookshop, of course. In this, in wartime, you read the back and you read the first paragraph. And then, for me... What I also do is dip into the middle and read a paragraph there as well. It's a kind of fail-proof fail um, method, I think. So the Galactic Whirlpool says on the back, Beyond the realm of the fe Federation, beyond the edge of the galaxy, a lost colony of humans in space drifts inexorably towards the Galactic Whirlpool. Whirlpool. <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that. Whirlpool. It's a compound noun. Kirk blazes new star trails to these strange people isolated for centuries. Unless he can convince them that the Enterprise crew members are not demons, they will be sucked into a churning one-way funnel of doom. That does sound epic. I'm not sure about funnel of doom. Um, right, first paragraph. Chapter one. Space, the final frontier, of course. A void as empty as death. A billion times a billion stars gleam like motes of sorrow whirling to the stately gavotte of time, like distant particles of dust caught and illuminated by a silver moonbeam. They are tiny beacons, each one a home for hope, no longer quite as distance, distant or unreachable, no longer quite so infinite, but still so very far away. The mind cannot comprehend the vastness, the emptiness, the silence. Here, even the dust of space is measured in the number of atoms by cubic kilometre. And in this emptiness, something moves. A tiny metal speck, almost insignificant, so alone, so far from home. So epic and science fiction-y the, the, for the start. But we'll um, dip into the middle. Uh, OK. Let's see how this reads. Catwen listened in silence, only occasionally asking for clarification of some minor point. There was so much, so much she did not understand. I am discovering that I have lived in a single corridor of the universe, and the universe is more than corridors. There were tears running down her cheeks again. I am joyous, Kevin Riley, at being given the, the gift of so much knowledge, but I am sad too, because I begin to see a little better now. She pointed at the Wanderer, still swelling in the forward port. It filled their view and still was so many kilometres distant. My world, we're at war. We've been at war for so long that no one now alive remembers a time when there was not a battle. There was mutiny many generations ago, a terrible battle. 
Kirk and Spock exchanged a meaningful glance. Spock's extrapolation had been correct. Catwen continued, the rebellion was crushed, but not without great damage to the world and strict controls established. The rebels who survived fled to the lower levels where they've lived ever since. Sometimes they raid the civilized part of the world, but the frontier is well guarded as you have seen. That's absolutely intriguing. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so easily sucked in. Yep, that feels epic and proper. I'm gonna go in a sec. Here's the Woofler and the Quark. Now, I was looking for this. This is a Grasshopper book from the mid-70s. Grasshopper were really interesting as kids' book publishers at that time. They Lots of what they did were um, in translation from um, European languages, usually. And they put them into English and sold them to kids in this country in these nice hardcovers. This has fantastic scribbly drawings. I love this. Mr. Bootle was a quiet, ordinary bank clerk. His only peculiarity was writing books about a strange creature called a quirk, an animal with a long, rubbery nose and a preference for hanging upside down by its toes. When the housekeeper found Mr. Bootle hanging upside down in the cupboard one morning, the trouble really started. That's the kind of book I would have loved when I was a kid. Look at this picture. Hanging upside down by his toes. See, it sounds like a, an Edward Lear poem come to life. One, strange things happen to Mr. Bootle. Have you heard of the quirk? I expect so. Most people have heard of him or read about him one time or another. However, just in case you haven't made his acquaintance, I'll let you know about him. He's not very big, but nice and round, with long spiky hairs on his back that stand on end when he's angry. That isn't often. He's a happy creature, the quirk. You'd like him, I'm sure. He eats absolutely everything. He's not at all particular. Nuts, bolts, cabbages, cockroaches or caviar, they all taste the same to the quirk. He gobbles them with great enjoyment. If he has food to spare, he stores it in his cheeks and saves it till later. He has long spiky whiskers, ginger ones and a long rubbery nose that wriggles when he's pleased, which is often. He always sleeps upside down, hanging by his toes like a bat. I expect you want to know the sort of noises he makes when he talks. It's useful to know if ever you met him. When he's happy, he suddenly bursts out with loud, whiffly squeaks, the sort and the sort of noise a humming top makes when you spin it very fast. When he's sad, you hear very little squeaks, like the noise a rubber ball makes when it has a hole in it. When he's angry, his hair stands on end, then his nose begins to twitch and he makes a strange snoring noise, like thunder rumbling. This sounds alarming, but it doesn't happen often. He's very quiet and gentle, very easy to get on with. Yes, I'm sure you'd like him. You'll wonder how I happen to know so much about the quirk. I happen to know the man who invented him, Mr. Benjamin Bootle. I could go on just reading from that. This is by Wendy Warham. Um, I'm not sure if this was in English first or not. Oh yeah, she's from Swanage. <laughs> so this was one of the um, the books in English to start with. Anyway, I think they're, they're a really interesting publisher. And I keep, every now and again, looking for other grasshopper books. I've gone over time. I didn't even get time to talk about Phil Redman's Grange Hill Stories, which leapt out of my bookcase. Um, I haven't read this for years and years, but it was a reread when I was a kid. Um, and all the other Grange Hill books. There was a whole series. Maybe one day I'll talk about that whole series in a different video. But for now, I'll have to say goodbye and then go and cook some dinner, I think. <clears throat> but I will see you again in another episode. Goodbye.